Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Loki season two, episode four, which hilariously blows up in our faces any hot takes we had about who was calling Loki and any hopes we had for Victor Timely's future, unless it was at a pasta night. But damn, that's what I love about this show. Let's break down this episode shot by shot for all the Easter eggs, visual details, timeline logic, and clues to find out how we can all avoid a horrible demise by spaghettification or time cube crushing. This season just keeps getting better and better, and a big part of this ride is being able to share this with you all. You've all been so supportive and wonderful each week, so thank you for giving new rock stars some of your time after every Loki episode. Please consider supporting us by grabbing our amazing new OB-inspired shirt available at nerdriot.shop. Thanks to Rocket Money for sponsoring today's video. More about them in a minute. Now we don't get the full Marvel Studios title card package this week. We just jump straight to the green card and then it gets blown toward us as we find ourselves inside of the surging sacred timeline like the opening of season one, episode six. And yeah, we're gonna spend some time on the sounds that we can try to make out from this opening 10 seconds. Listen closely. Actually, for good measure, let's listen again. Now, when we were in this space in the opening of the season one finale, the sound mixers actually snuck in a ton of sound bites from MCU history and real world history. And I'm willing to bet that they did the same thing here, but these are just kind of harder to make out. Though I do think I can start to separate some sounds out. We do hear some whispering at the top, followed by a shouting voice that kind of sounds like Loki. As the title card swipes away, it sounds like a group of people chanting something, almost like the witches in Agatha's Coven and WandaVision when they chanted, Moore's Monstru Natural. No, I cannot control it. Then we hear a long wailing voice from a male character that kind of sounds like Doctor Strange falling through the multiverse and Multiverse of Madness. Then a few other screams. And I really do think one of them might be this scream. And then it ends on what sounds like a woman chuckling. That almost sounds like the voice of Agatha Harkness. And obviously I brought up Agatha twice here. I just love Katherine Hahn. Everything kind of sounds like her voice to me. Really, I think what we are hearing are just the screams of terror and confusion of everyone on these branch timelines breaking off from the sacred timeline as all of these histories collide with each other and form incursions. When we last saw this Citadel rock in the season one finale, there was more order to everything. Like there was a solid curved sacred timeline, a dark void beyond it, an intact asteroid with the Citadel on top with the light on. But now, it's all scrambled together. The asteroid has broken up into chunks. The timeline now streaks in various directions like lightning, the blues swirling in with the purples. I mentioned in last week's breakdown that the design choice to give the asteroid and the Citadel Kintsugi crack patterns ended up foreshadowing that this place was designed to crumble because it gave these fissures preset fault lines to follow. Miss Minutes conjures an orange scan of the room, which visually reminds me of the tech used by Gwen Stacy and Jessica Drew in across the Spider-Verse to reconstruct Jonathan Owen's apartment crime scene. In both cases, it shows us that this multiversal network keeps digital 3D scans of all history to play it back when they need to. Miss Minutes uses this scan to create a dollhouse-sized version of the room, which is interesting because that's something he remains did to talk about his backstory. But one thing to note here is that there are two chairs with their backs to the window and no desk inside this smaller version. So this wasn't a formal study for he remains to write, 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 write. It was really a lounge for two people to sit and enjoy each other's company. Renslayer's face looms large in the window frame behind these recordings. So it's almost ready. A utopia at the end of time. For us. For all time. Always. This is the recording Loki heard in the past TVA, back in season two, episode one. For us. For all time. Always. Professor Renslayer, you are quite a marvel. 
Renslayer wears her Hunter uniform, which I will remind you is marked A23, a nod to 1963's Avengers number 23, the debut of Princess Ravona Renslayer as a disinterested love interest to Kang the Conqueror. Her wearing tactical gear here tells us that we are right at the end of the Multiversal War, and that Renslayer tipped it by choosing to help this Kang variant tame Eliath. If these two are variants of each other, and Renslayer is his female variant, it could have been similar to Loki and Sylvie needing to join hands to tame Eliath, and that's how he remains and Renslayer did it, to use Eliath to prune all other Kang's timelines to win this war. In this shot, he remains head is framed in front of Renslayer's cheek, where a teardrop would be. Notice Major's delivery on... I will be proud to lead with you. You made a difference in this war. Thank you for being on my team. It's clear that He Remains just can't stomach a true partnership. He Remains says that he'll catch up in a bit. In a long road. See you soon. See you soon. These were his final words for Sylvie in the season one finale. See you soon. And the words the timekeeper android head said after it was beheaded. He Remains then repeats the word always, and he puts his hands together in a brief prayer pose, which is what he did to mockingly praise the timekeepers as being the gods. Miss Minutes pops up to offer a game of chess. She told Victor last episode that her original function was as a chess mate to He Remains, but instead he says, Pull up protocol 42. Is it time? Erase her memories. There's that pesky number 42 again. Obligatory reminder that 42 is the answer to the great question in Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide books. It is Miles Morales' Spider's Universe number in the Spider-Verse films. It's Jackie Robinson's number. 42 showed up on The Laundry Ticket and Everything Everywhere All at Once, a movie that also starred Ki Huey Kwan. 42 was on Ripley's Pulse Rifle and Aliens. And most recently, 42 was a compartment of X5's temp pad that Loki was prodding back in episode two. See, screenwriters and set decorators just love to plug 42 in everywhere. But but also, we should note that 42 was the final of the six recurring numbers of Lost, preceded by, it's worth noting, 23, which was Renslayer's Hunter ID. Wait a minute. 15 is B-15's ID, so now we just gotta find a 16, an 8, and a 4, and we get a free fish cookie from the Dharma Initiative Polar Bear Cage. But in this case, Protocol 42 has the vibes of Execute Order 66, because it erases the memories of not just Renslayer, but everyone currently in the TVA. This was something he had previously discussed with Miss Minutes. Miss Minutes confirms to Renslayer, You didn't just help. It was you who commanded the army. So he built this little tower. Yeah, notice how dust falls timed perfectly as Renslayer's understanding of her history crumbles. Miss Minutes says that they don't need him and maybe they never did. Like the opening shot of the season, we are back to a big face of He Who Remains, but this time it is part of the wall of the war room that Loki had pruned back. Victor Timely steps right through it, through his own face. This particular face will come back as a recurring image throughout the episode in a very important moment later on. In fact, this will be the face that spells his own doom. Throughout these opening minutes, we hear the sound kind of like groaning metal right before a building collapses. Kind of like he remains is on a sinking ship, which is interesting because he cut Ravona loose last episode on a lifeboat. Instead, he is on the ship that will be sinking. The PA overhead announces Chrono Centers 11, 29, 14 offline. And then later, Chrono Centers 32, 81, 7 offline. Victor checks out the murals in the corner where Loki and Mobius chatted back in the season two premiere, depicting the timekeepers and to the left, warring Kang variants. One of these is probably the one who shoved him back in the 1860s of Chicago when he was a baby. Mobius tells him, Here's the deal. You have to trust us, and we don't have time. I'm from Chicago, friend. The shadiocracy capital of the world. I don't trust anyone. Shadiocracy? That's not a word. Kind of sounds like a word he just made up because, you know, he is a con man. He's just kind of making up stuff all the time. But if we break down the parts of the word, shade means harm and chrissy means rule. So kind of the rule by harm, which does align with how Chicago has been dubbed the Windy City, not just for the cold wind off Lake Michigan, but as some theorize from an 1890 article by New York Sun editor Charles Dana complaining about Chicago's corrupt moves to secure the hosting of the World's Fair that the city's politicians were full 
of hot air, the Windy City. However, according to History.com, etymologist Barry Popick cited earlier headlines from rivaling Midwestern cities calling Chicago by that term, like an 1876 headline from the Cincinnati Inquirer that was meant to be double-edged for a tornado that hit Chicago, but also for the city's speakers that were full of wind. This is your Chicago history lesson of this week. All right, so B-15 tells Judge Gamble that Docs and the others are in holding, and Gamble tells her, eh, you kind of need to forgive her. We need all the help we can get right now. On the chronomonitor screen, we see the words loom unstable flashing, and we see how there are way more red lines in the danger zone than we last saw. Down on the RNA level, we start with this close-up of the hot coffee, hot chocolate, and soup machine that will later enchant Victor Timely. Casey works on a small monitor that displays core displaced VA234 map, which I presume shows the throughput diameter of the loom. Victor meets OB, and this is a fascinating moment. OB? Ouroboros. <laughs> Ouroboros responds. But I learned everything I know from a brilliant 19th century inventor named Victor Timely. If we had the resources, he would have been bigger than Einstein. In little detail, we hear the sound of a pneumatic tube in effect showing OB's realization like, oh, what? And this tube coming in right now? Come on, TBA, you're in an existential crisis. Why are you giving OB more busy work? He remains always originated from a 19th century variant. And despite what happens to Victor Timely this episode, in some past historical cycle, some Victor Timely went on to successfully build the TBA from this notebook inspiring OG OB in the process. But is that the case? I have a whole separate video breaking down who actually built the TBA based off of this chicken and an egg paradox here. It's just interesting that despite he remains wiping all of their memories in these past cycles, OB still remembers the name Victor Timely as if it was just a name plucked from history. This is another example of OB being immune to everything else he remains or miss minutes due in the TVA. I just think he is equally important to the TVA's founding. He was there when it started and these men just kind of influenced each other. Loki says, So if your work is based on his work and his work is based on your exactly work. Exactly which came first. It's like a snake eating its own tail. A snake eating its own tail, an obvious nod to the mythological root of the term Ouroboros. It is a snake eating its own tail. The idea here is that it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Both men influenced each other in different ways through different cycles of history. Because time is a flat circle, this stuff kind of just repeats itself. So while from Victor Timely's perspective, he just received this book and Ouroboros inspired him to be a great inventor, Ouroboros in his own history was inspired by a Victor Timely from the Sacred Timeline who was a brilliant Kang variant who was just placed at that point in history with ahead of his time thinking that inspired Ouroboros in the TVA. It's Victor Timely's destiny to become a He Remains that inspires OB, and it's OB's destiny to become a hardworking member of the TVA to inspire Victor Timely. What we're seeing here is what's called the grandfather paradox or the bootstrap paradox. Time travel movies are filled with examples of this, like how Marty McFly pushes his dad out of the way of the car, thus preventing his parents from falling in love and having him, which means he would have been able to travel back in time to prevent them from falling in love. See, it's kind of a paradox there. I quickly want to point out this take a tab dispenser in the background with just a bunch of tickets sticking out of it. Again, no one has visited OB in hundreds of years. So, you know, this just made me laugh. There's also a sign on one of the shelves that just reads tacos. Maybe instead of key lime pie, they used to have a taco Tuesday. And then behind Casey in this one angle is a new poster we haven't seen yet. Prevent self pruning, service your time stick every 674 minutes. I think that's what that says. Which would be every 11 and a quarter hours Hours? That's very often. Servicing one stick twice per day? There are some gross places to take that. But rather than a kind of suicide prevention PSA so that no one pulls a season one, episode five Sylvie, it suggests that pruning sticks need frequent recharging and upkeep or they'll malfunction and cause the user to accidentally self prune. OB wheels out this model. Here's a model I mocked up of the loom. Forgive the shoddy and slapdash work. Uh, it's not to scale. I only got one coat of paint on there. And Mobius compliments him. Okay, I think you're being a little hard on yourself, Obi. It looks great. All right. And Obi smiles. Yeah, this is a direct reference to the model walkthrough scene in Back to the Future. Please excuse the crudity of this model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. It's good. Oh, thank you, thank you. I love this joke because in both cases, the models look freaking great, but engineers are often perfectionists apologizing for projects that are easily the best work in class. The way OB walks through it is pretty much the same way Doc Brown walks us through the Hill Valley Town Square, minus the figurine ended up catching on fire, but I think that's a joke too, because what's at the far end of that walkway? Victor Timely. He's gonna be the one who walks this walk and faces a similarly grisly explosive end. As OB hops the figurine down the gangway behind Victor, we actually see this sign in case people didn't hear OB, 
it reads not to scale. And I love how that little red sign has a TVA logo at the top of it. Like this is something that OB printed out thinking it would be official TVA usage on a regular basis to label things not to scale. OB says the throughput multiplier will manage the backlog of branches. That was created when someone killed he who remains and released all those branches and ruined my life. Yeah, Sylvie proudly smiles when the stabbing of he who remains is brought up, but she has no reaction when Obi says this ruined his life. Loki and Mobius bicker over whose shape the figurine better matches, and I'm surprised Mobius considers himself the slimmer of the two after all the pie he's been eating. Victor provides his own throughput multiplier as a solution, and he tells Obi, Mr. Ouroboros, if anyone can, it's you and me. Sylvie senses something disturbing about this partnership because since both these men inspired each other, a handshake is really more self-congratulatory. Like, you know, servicing one stick. She senses that there could be another He Remains and there's more to the story of how the TVA got founded. Mobius and Loki head out, passing a sign, engineering personnel only. Are you meant to be down here? With a very grumpy looking engineer. Makes me wonder if the rarely attended TVA automat might be only for employees on this level, of which there's only one, OB, and that could be why OB is resistant to past TVA memory wipes. Sylvie calls out Mobius for wanting pie, and we get another reminder that Mobius is weirdly unconcerned with his sacred timeline life. Is she so upset because she knows the at-risk branch is Broxton McDonald's Jack, who I think could be a young Mobius? Yeah, I'm gonna keep beating that drum. Sylvie here is lit from behind, making her face somewhat shadowed, whereas Mobius is set like an interrogation room, harsh light right over his head, completely dark background, so we could see every reaction on his face as Sylvie calls him out. You know who's good with money? Tony Stark. You know who's good with rockets? Iron Man. Even if you're not super rich or a superhero, you can supercharge your finances by using Rocket Money, the all-in-one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. Got unwanted subscription payments? Rocket Money can take care of those for you. Rocket Money can also deposit your money into a smart savings account, help you understand your spending with its budgeting tool, and even help negotiate bills. Once you sign up for free, you can unlock even more features with premium. I've been using Rocket Money's smart savings account for ages and because of that, I was able to save up for a trip to New York. I just took a plane instead of, you know, a Mark 7. To try Rocket Money out now and support our channel, head to rocketmoney.com slash newrockstars or click the link in the video's description. Meanwhile, in prisoner holding, General Dox sits in the center of the room, her chair directly over the crushed table that we saw last episode, while the others hover near the perimeter of the room. Dox knows that being crushed with a time cube in this room is likely, and as the leader of the group, she is sitting here to say, you know what, just crush me. Don't crush the others who are just following my orders. Brad says, if we just try to figure this out, we can get out of this room and we can get back to our lives. I believe it was Galileo or or Winston Churchill. Oh, or you just somebody... cut the shit! It's pretty funny that he mixes these two up, considering he works for an agency that oversees all of history. Galileo was an Italian astronomer born in 1564, Winston Churchill, a British prime minister born in 1874. The two had very little in common. Actually, it's interesting though that he brings up Galileo because Galileo was tried by the Roman Inquisition in 1615. He was branded a heretic for his heliocentrism theory, and throughout his life he had to recant parts of his theories to avoid death. As B-15 talks to them, Brad rests his hands on his collar, the same way he used to his chest plate and previous episodes when he was wearing his hunter uniform. Just the color just seems like kind of an awkward thing to be holding on to that way. As B-15 checks in with D-90 outside, we see this room is labeled CCC-073, and it's in the same part of the TVA with that slanted curved wall that we saw in season one, episode four, when Loki and Sylvie were detained. Loki's interrogation room didn't look like this, so it kind of seems like they have different interior designs for these cells, depending on what psychological state they want their inmates to be in. Meanwhile, on the automat, we get a closer look at the pie drawers. Despite there only being one flavor, they still label every drawer, and it looks like it costs three tokens per slice. Compare this to the one token it costs to get a cup of hot cocoa. Sylvie ended up here after taking a wrong turn. This automat really just kind of seems like an odd dead end that absent-minded wandering employees always wander back to. Loki passes this poster, bring your own cup. If you forget, remember it next time. We do not provide cups or employ dishwashers. So why doesn't the TVA have a food service staff? What do they want people to forget is left over on these plates? Hold that thought. I'm gonna blow your mind. Loki recaps the events of the Thor film. Some years ago, my brother was banished from Asgard and sent to Earth. And when he came back, he was different, changed somehow. I thought it was weakness. I mocked him, said he'd gone soft. 
Thor actually was stronger at the end of this, having proved himself worthy of wielding Mjolnir and ultimately defeating Loki. But since this Loki got taken from the year 2012 on the timeline, that would have been the second most recent battle that he had gone through. And I just like that the events of this Loki series have matured him on a similar path that the events of Thor the Dark World did and Ragnarok did. Loki tells Sylvie that destruction is easy, but fixing things is hard. And hope itself is hard. Actually, the Norse rune for hope actually looks a lot like a branch timeline, you could say. The sentiment is similar to the one Loki expressed to Sylvie in episode two, when he said it's harder to stay. Loki declares that you can't just give people free will and walk away, that it's up to them to do better than he remains did. Sounds like whatever we do, we're playing God. We are gods. Now, while you could see this line as Loki finding a way to justify his is this not easier speech from the 2012 Avengers, I love the decision to frame this line from Loki in wide. Because if Loki were in close up, the line, we are gods, would look kind of proud and powerful. But since they are so small in the frame, it makes them look powerless and minuscule, conceding to an immense burden to look after the average people while getting no praise or thanks for it. Like humans raise statues to Thor, to Odin, to freaking Baldur the Brave, but not to Loki. He's doing a thankless task. Renslayer and Miss Minutes arrive in prisoner holding, making an offer to General Dox and her people. Anyone who joins me right here, follows me out that door, and helps me restore stability to the TVA will have a life on the timeline if they want it. Remember, this is the same offer Miss Minutes made to Sylvie and to Loki before they pushed forward to get past her to He Remains in the season one finale. When Miss Minutes goes in and out of the time cube machine to activate it, she comes out with this devilish little grin, like she's enjoying this way too much. Later, when the cube begins to tighten, Miss Minutes becomes overwhelmed with glee. She is evil. Miss Minutes and Renslayer know just from Brad's inability to look Docs in the eyes that he doesn't need to be contained in the cube. He has made his decision. And what follows is one of the most horrific deaths we have seen in the MCU. Yet somehow the second most horrific death this episode. We stay on Brad's face for most of this. In only one brief moment does he open his eyes to look into Docs' eyes, but then he promptly closes them and then only looks above the cube. Because again, with that graded floor, they would be crushed into viscera and that would ooze down to the drain. And I'm sorry to dwell on this too much, but the last thing each of these poor people felt was the flesh of each other. It's one thing to get crushed alone in a time cube because the walls of it would be your greatest enemy, but to do it to a group of people makes each other's bodies the thing that ends up killing you. And that is just unimaginably cruel. Later, when B-15 finds the remains, we only see her reaction, but we hear the sound of a steamy sizzle, which makes me think that their viscera is still bubbling. B-15 tries to access diagnostics on her temp pad. Uh-uh-uh. Access denied. Uh, nod to Dennis Nedry's computer in Jurassic Park. Uh-uh-uh. You didn't say the magic word. Loki sees one director, Kate Heron, said that Miss Minutes was partly inspired by Jurassic Park's Mr. DNA character. But notice how we edit directly from the steamy heat lines over B-15's face to the bubbling hot cocoa as it globs into the cup. That had to be intentional, like the remains are draining directly into this cup. Before the season, back in August, I theorized that the green pie could be a nod to Soylent Green and that it is made of people when they're killed. When we do see the killing room in Soylent Green, we should note the comfort color the man chooses is the color orange. So maybe all the sweets that Mobius has been consuming in the TVA are the remains of his co-workers. My theory back in August was that the Soylent Green pie is designed to leave the TVA employees doped up, to keep them on task, to keep them from asking the right questions. I'll admit, when I posed this theory in that August 15th video, I didn't think anything would come from it, but sure enough, I I am pretty surprised to see it possible right now. After sipping the hot cocoa, D90 constricts and he prunes, and we think for a second it's because of the drink, but no, it is X5 behind him, pruning D90 in the back, hiding himself just like Loki will do to his time slipping self later. And when the hot cocoa hits the floor, notice where X5 is looking when he says, I'm sorry. He is looking down at the cocoa as he says this. Could he know that the sweets contain his former comrades or at least reminded of their juices sloshing on the floor? Actually, can we get an X5? Does he know, thumbnail? Does he know? Later when they see the spill on the ground, it kind of looks like a person with two arms outstretched trying to crawl away. I know, I'm totally reaching, but I just want my hot, hot summer theory to be true. Back in the RNA department, OB's computer scans Mobius' temp pad, anomalies reports, 32 files, loop computation, 23 files, temporal, either 616 or S16, which would mean we found a 16. Punch that ABC lost numbers punch card. And that's uh, 2,252 files. Then Chicago logs, 3,325 files. And variance reports, 23 files. Now that fourth one might not be the word Chicago, but Chicago logs is what you get after you eat Lumonati's and Portello's in the same day. Obi asks Mobius. Did you download unauthorized games again? No. 
I'm not gonna make that mistake twice. I really hope the game that Mobius downloaded was a jet ski one, but also OB remembers this past violation despite Mobius only remembering meeting OB like two days ago. So did Mobius recently download a game to his temp pad in the past 48 hours or something while they were dealing with this crisis? Mobius says, Timely's gone. Miss Minutes is back. Yeah, Mobius hears the cash register ding sound effect that we started hearing with Miss Minutes back in episode three, but then they drag Victor into the war room. Miss Minutes stands on the table directly in front of the wall where the He Remains faces are, showing how her goal is to supplant He Remains. In episode three, she projected her face over a mannequin to signal her want of a corporeal body. Now she projects herself over He Remains face to show her ambition to take over the TVA. The loom overload escalates and we see gold colored bands exploding like spaghetti boiling out of a pot, spilling over the first ring. Meanwhile, on the right side of the loom, the timeline it is forming doesn't really look that great either. A lot of times in the MCU, CGI and swirling animated glowing energy just kind of looks like nothing, having no weight. But every shot we've seen of this thing, the fact that they refer to it as a tangible archaic artisan tool, a loom, just makes it a fascinating thing to look at every time. Over the PA, we hear... Ah, Loki now recognizes this sound because it's the same one he heard back at the end of the season two premiere. He suspects he is caught up to that point in the future. As I mentioned in the episode one breakdown, the sirens going off, the panic, the meltdown countdown reminds me of season two of Lost. When the numbers have run down, they didn't punch the code in time and Desmond has to turn the failsafe key below the hatch. The hatch explodes, but he ends up okay. He's just kind of naked and sort of unstuck in time, experiencing the future. I think that's what's gonna happen to Loki in the next two episodes. Now they approach the Loom Room X-Men doors, we're now calling them. By the way, these doors, plus some graffiti I definitely did not spot in episode two that apparently read all M are brothers. According to Screen Rant's interview with Dan Deliu, these were not really planned. They might've just been an art department thing, but Dan Deliu said that his teacher once told his class when it comes to inferring meaning without stated authorial intent, quote, well, if it's there, it's there. So make of that what you will. I think the cooler detail about this entrance to the Loom Room are these little symbols above the threshold on either side of mortal danger. These look like the Loki series version of something referred to as semiotic standard. This is actually something I uncovered in my deep dive of Ridley Scott's Alien. Semiotic standard is a pictographic signage system developed by designer Ron Cobb for the interiors of the Nostromo, referring to cautions or things you can find in the next part of the ship. It's honestly one of my favorite discoveries in Hollywood science fiction because ever since Alien, sci-fi production designers have used variations on semiotic standard everywhere. Like you could see it in the 2009 Sam Rockwell movie Moon. Trust me, you're gonna start to see these little semiotic standard signs in everything. And here above the X door are a whole bunch of TVA semiotic standard signs, probably only readable by OB, probably every warning they have in the book. And now we circle back to the same imagery we saw in the season two, episode one episode, past Loki, or time slipping Loki, with his shirt sleeve slash and bloody, holding the meter, looking for a pruning stick. But now we see it from a new perspective. Sylvie is stuck in Miss Minute's sabotaged elevator and in episode four, Loki, with the jacket, retracing his steps and seeing himself from behind. Back in season two, episode one, you could actually see that episode four Loki in a brief shot behind episode one Loki in the shadows just out of focus. And like Harry Potter realizing he was the one who sent the Patronus to his past self in Prisoner of Azkaban, Loki realizes what he has to do and he prunes his past self. He has to close the loop just like he remains as trying to close the loop with Victor Timely. And it requires a kind of self pruning despite the warning on the poster in the RNA we saw earlier. Earlier. And then we finally get an answer to who was calling on the phone. Hello? About time. What's taking you guys so long? Ha <laughs> ha! We had all of these theories on who might be on the other end of that line. And everyone from Loki himself to Thor was put forward as a possibility. This is one subversion of expectations I'm totally okay with. Ubi warns that if they take Miss Minutes offline, they'll lose the other functions of the TVA. The dampeners that prevent people from using magic at the TVA. Turn it off! Yes, both Loki and Sylvie have been so frustrated to be unable to use their magic inside the TVA. Of course, this is how two variants of each other would respond. Miss Minutes begins to reboot and some Fascinating stuff happens here. Someone's trying to reboot the system. I can't, can't, can't access it. I'm being lo locked out. Lo 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 locked out. Well, marking this just isn't necessary. Yeah, Victor doesn't know what digital glitching looks like, so he just assumes she's stuttering to make fun of him. But her glitching begins with her facial dial spinning clockwise, and then she goes through her reboot. Victor, I need to tell you. Tell, tell you, 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 you. I need to tell you. You'll never be him. 
Some really cool visual details here. Binary code of ones and zeros fill her body and X's form over her eyes as if she's dead, but she summons a final breath to tell Victor, you'll never be him with one eye glitched out like a villainous missing eye. And then she disappears to reveal the background face she's once again perfectly aligned with, the true he remains. We briefly see a floppy disk and the words, a problem has been detected and system will shut down to prevent damage. And then collecting data for a crash dump, initializing disk for crash dump, beginning dump of physical memory, computing critical memory to disk, and critical is misspelled. Also, crash dump, that's what you get at the end of the day that you double dipped on Lumal Nadis and Portillo's. The TVA logo flashes for a split second with dollar signs and the hourglass logo formed above, and then a very basic version of Miss Minutes with arms and legs, but just a clock face with no eyes or mouth, but 12, 3, 6, and 9, and those numbers kind of jump around on the face. And immediately after she disappears, the focus shifts from where she just was to that that center version of He Remains Face looking like he is glaring at Victor Timely for disappointing him. So what did Miss Minutes mean by you'll never be him? I think she is calling back the fact that he cut off her sentence back in episode three and instead of saying I love you, she's saying the most cutting thing and cutting for ways we do not yet realize. By saying this to him and by forcing him to look into the eyes of his alternate self, she is putting a chip on his shoulder. She is dooming Victor into playing the hero and making a stupid decision. She's setting a self-fulfilling prophecy for him. Sylvie immediately enchants Brad using the same body control magic that she used in season one, episode two in the Rock's Card Superstore. So we get this fun bit of the actor Rafael Casal doing a Sylvie impression. X5, what's going on? This is cozy. I didn't think I'd see you again so soon. Renslayer gets pruned, and because of the outfit she is wearing, her outline looks like an hourglass, resembling the multicolored painting of the hourglass on the wall that Loki, Sylvie, and Timely run by just a second later. Victor sticks his head in the temporal aura scanner, and the computer opens up. Welcome, he who remains. Notice that the voice is male now, because it is not Miss Minutes. Now, above their heads on the ceiling, there is this dome-shaped dial, and now we can see several numbers on it. From the right, there's 972-858-778-723, and wait a minute, is that 616? Six? On the other side of it, it starts with zero, then 46, and then a few others. But if that is 616, these all could correspond to universe numbers. And none of the other ones really matched up for me, but Earth 723 does refer to a universe where the world is unified by music. That's from a 2006 Star brand comic. I don't know, the needles of this dial spin past all of these numbers. It's not really clear what they refer to. But Victor volunteers to take the throughput multiplier out to the loom just in case something goes wrong. He was spurred by Miss Minutes telling him you'll never be him. She put the chip on Victor's shoulder. He should not be doing this because what makes makes a he remains is a he who remains. Not one who goes out to be the hero, but a coward who stays behind to let other people kill themselves. Which leads to this brilliant moment. Okay, I'm gonna give you all a sense of how shockingly tall I am with a standing ovation to Marvel for actually doing this. Victor Timely within seconds spaghettifies. Actually, if you look closely, the VFX artist made his bones visible. You can see a rib cage, a spine, even a skull jawbone. That means Victor Timely felt the flesh spaghettify off his bones. I gotta hand it to Jonathan Majors for his blood curdling scream under that helmet. Each spaghetti strand even disappears after the fact. Just one final one puffing into a smoke ring. Like the Scott Lang doppelganger in the probability storm in Ant-Man the Wasp Quantumania, and what Wanda Maximoff did to Reed Richards, a guy who is technically related to Victor Timely, his body turns into to spaghetti, which is actually a concept in theoretical physics when one would enter a black hole. In fact, Victor Timely was rushed into this room so fast he probably didn't take a beat to read what was on the floor warning about this. And actually, in the final frames, after you see Victor Timely's skull, a blast of light pulses out from the strands, which I think could be Victor's temporal aura leaving his body. I think that Miss Minutes telling Victor you'll never be him was an intentional move by her to get him to do something stupid like this. She's the one who put him on a course toward his own death. And why did she do that? Because she wants to screw over he remains failsafe plan because his plan for a successor to complete his loop has now been broken. There is no he who actually remained anymore. And I love how we get individual reaction shots for each character and then kind of a shared reaction in real time as the camera moves from person to person. They each have an individual distinct moment for themselves, but Casey has the funniest reaction. What did we do wrong? I don't know. The poor guy, after years of being looked down and bullied by the hunters who went by his desk, right now he just wants everyone to know that this wasn't his fault. Loki says, I don't know. 
And there's something chilling this time when Tom Hiddleston says, I don't know. He spent this episode assuring everyone that things would be okay. When he completed his own loop of destiny, he had so much confidence thinking for once he was in control of his fate and now he realizes no way. He had told Sylvie that their mission now had to be rebuilding the TVA. Now he doesn't even know what his purpose is or what all of this was even for. The loom explodes, enveloping all of the branches and sending a wall of radiation blasting toward them. We are seeing the TVA's Ragnarok event, something that this Loki never actually lived through. If you think about it, we are seeing the bursting of a dam flooding them. But if you think about it, couldn't you see a dam as something that was violating nature? I'm going to be getting into that in a video I have coming out this weekend. But the light gets brighter and brighter until Loki has to shut his eyes against it and then everything stops. We just cut to black like it's the final shot of The Sopranos. What comes after death? Maybe nothing. Isn't that the ultimate fear? Now the closing credits casting photo screen includes a photo of Loki pruning himself. He remains in Renslayer in the Citadel. Mobius after Sylvie told him off. OB meeting Victor and Victor's time to be brave death march. So what comes next? Season one episode four ended with what we thought was the death of Loki but really just ended up being his transference to somewhere else. The Void. I suspect a similarly trippy episode five of this season. Remaining unseen trailer footage suggests that we are in store for lots more parts of the TVA spaghettifying, and Loki has some more time slipping to do, headed to Piranha Power Sports where he will find Mobius in a jet ski transaction. Really, I think Loki could try to time slip again, back to an earlier hour or earlier day, sometime within the TVA to try to prevent this crisis sooner, maybe by taking Victor's place. Because we know that the dampeners are off, Loki can use some of his sorcery, he may try to take Victor's place, or maybe Mobius's place all the way back in season two, episode one. Hell, he may time slip back to the Citadel with Sylvie and with He Remains. Jonathan Majors was reported to appear in three out of six episodes this season, so we may end this season with a replay of the season one finale with Loki and Sylvie continuing their conversation in the Citadel with the original He Remains. Good God, everyone, Loki season two has it all. I don't think I've ever had so much fun analyzing episodes of a Marvel series. Comment down below where you think these final two episodes are gonna go from here. Again, our OB shirt is just amazing. I'm gonna be wearing it all the time from here on out. So grab one for yourself and celebrate with me, nerdriot.shop, subscribe to all three Three channels in the new Rockstars Network. Thank you to Gina Ippolito for helping me write this breakdown. Follow me at EA Voss and I'll see you next week. Bye everybody.